It is Tuesday, September 20th, 2011. This is InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Alex Jones. Coming up later in this important transmission, we're going to be talking to economist, researcher, investor, the head of Euro-Pacific Capital, who just testified before Congress, Peter Schiff. Then we've got breaking news from Kurt Haskell, one of the survivors of the Christmas Day underwear bombing. He's a lawyer, and he's been attending the pre-trial activities for Mutalib, the underwear bomber, in Detroit. He's got breaking news that the national media is ignoring. An important broadcast note, I had told radio listeners and Infowars.com readers today that we were going to have our Gardasil special uh, report tonight, uh, one of many more we're going to be doing. But I've decided to go ahead and do that tomorrow night because Dr. Andrew Wakefield, himself a victim of the Big Pharma hoax machine, will be joining us in studio tomorrow. And this is such an important subject. I want to cover the full spectrum of information. But here's the bottom line. Merck is invading the planet. They are everywhere buying off politicians and pushing uh, their dangerous cancer virus vaccine that's been proven, according to the CDC, with only 2% of adverse uh, reactions being reported, that 18,000 plus people have had adverse reactions, autoimmune diseases, convulsions, narcolepsy, and even death. And the establishment has really miscalculated. They panicked in the last week when this became one of the biggest national news stories, when Michelle Bachman and others uh, expose what Rick Perry was up to along with Ron Paul. And now a bioethicist with connections to Merck has offered $10,000 reward for proof. A $10,000 reward for proof that anybody's ever been hurt by Gardasil. This is ridiculous. We showed you last night, we're going to show you tomorrow night, even more documents that the government is aware of this and what's happening. So that's coming up tomorrow evening. Continuing though, here's the big alert. It's on the governor's desk right now. We need to just start numbering these. They go to one, go to two, go to three. Now here's the really big news. Merck tried to get Perry to run the hoax that it was the law to take Gardasil here in Texas. And then of course it came out that it wasn't a law and it was all a giant hoax. So now they've actually gone to the California legislature and gotten them to pass legislation that's on the governor's desk now awaiting signing that makes it the law that the school can brainwash the kids, very young children, and get their consent without the parents knowing. This is just like kids can get abortions without their parents knowing, but you got to get a letter to let them go to the zoo. This is crazy. Well, now they're going to shoot your kids up with vaccines and not even ever let you know that it happened. And I've got clips of vaccine representatives and others on the news we're going to play tomorrow saying it's reasonable to shoot your kids up and not even let you know that they did it. This is absolutely amazing and is incredible tyranny. We're going to be breaking this all down. And then finally, did you know Rupert Murdoch's heavily invested? in the flu shots and the H1N1 and all of the deaths and problems that that caused? Did you know a lot of other big mega media moguls are involved as well? This is a $50 billion a year industry. And it's time that we expose what these merchants of death are doing. Their vaccines don't work and they've been linked to killing people and maiming others. It's all coming up tomorrow night. Now, we've got two in-depth interviews with, again, Peter Schiff and, of course, Kurt uh, Haskell coming up. So I only have one other area of news I want to focus on uh, tonight in the news and analysis segment, and that's Obama on the chopping block. You know, when we put out the Obama deception back in, what, March of 2009, a lot of people were shocked by it. And it's since been watched by more than 35 million people online. And they said, you mean he's going to be politically built up and then destroyed? And that this is all basically staged? Alex, that's never going to happen. Well, let's go ahead and play this clip. Uh, that's a, a few snippets from my film, The Obama Deception, that we released just a few months after Obama was in office, predicting that he would later be politically destroyed. Presidents are now little more than corporate pitch men who take all the political heat while the controllers remain in the shadows, safe from public scrutiny. In the real executive power structure, the president serves the military-industrial complex. 
its cell phone by the international bankers. If there's a revolution, the population just throws out the prime minister or president. The elite stays in power because the public is never aware of who the real enemy is. Upon Obama's inauguration, members of the Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, and CFR flooded into every position of power in the executive branch, replacing Trilateral Commission and CFR members who previously filled the positions during the Bush administration. When you and we get more into it in the film and also the sequel, Fall of the Republic, it was released just four or five months after the Obama deception, and the films are, are evergreen. You see, I have an analogy that I've used. It's been picked up by the national media, and it's basically that a president is like a shield for the New World Order when they're a puppet. And the establishment picks up the shield, whether it's Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Obama, and it gets attacked, it gets bashed in. And when they're done, they throw it down and pick up a new shield. And that's exactly what's happening. And the bigger they get built up, the harder they fall. They have built Obama up like he is the absolute savior of the earth. And in that way, when the depression sets in and the banksters uh, consolidate our economy as well as the euro, which is now happening, they can simply bring in another Rick Perry or Mitt Romney or other puppet or even another Democratic challenger uh, for the nomination for the, the uh, Democratic uh, presidency, uh, candidacy, and fool folks a little bit longer instead of looking past the puppets to the actual people that hold the strings. And here it is in uh, the news today, just a small smattering. Remember, this is teleprompter-free news, ladies and gentlemen. This is my analysis, my information. So occasionally I'll uh, kind of falter or stutter. Sometimes the show's 30 minutes, sometimes it's two hours long because it's real. This is real information, not somebody reading off a teleprompter. Why are teleprompters important? The system can load its propaganda in at a thousand points and have a unified message. This is true alternative media. Continuing, uh, here's the Chicago Tribune. Why Obama should withdraw? Continuing, Washington Times. Liberals vow to challenge Obama in Democratic primary. So you're seeing uh, these headlines uh, everywhere as they're flushing Obama. Now Obama faces questions on his investments. USA Today, this was always known about the corruption and the Chicago uh, chicanery. Again, I'm not defending Obama. He's just a mid-level front man that reads off teleprompters. Uh, it's now coming out, you know, the head of the Black Caucus says if Obama wasn't president, we would have marched on the White House a long time ago. Uh, Obama administration reworked uh, the big solar company loan to favor donor, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Notice these are all in his strongholds, Democratic Party establishment turning on him. And it's because they're getting ready to throw him overboard to try to get a new puppet in. The system needs a new shield. Before, a shill would last four to eight years for the establishment. Now they last a matter of months. He had one of the lowest approval ratings of presidential history just six months after being in office from one of the highest. In fact, there's one over there on the screen. Obama hits new low in another poll, 39%. Again, as they prepare to fully bring down this economy as they prepare to offer you their new puppets as the solution they have to first destroy the old puppet and we're at a very dangerous point right now with puppet obama because if some of the insiders that are in his camp decide to try to keep him in power they're going to stage terror attacks and say that his enemies did it or they could even stage an assassination i've always said that obama could be the next big inside job we want nothing to happen to this puppet we, we want nothing to happen to George W. Bush. They're rancid little nobody puppets for the elite. We want to go after the actual people that are using them as shields. We want to go after them with the Constitution, with the Bill of Rights, because they are the people that are steering our economy over the edge of a cliff. And that's why I and many others like Gerald Salente, Ron Paul, have been able to predict it. And with more on the president's job plan and the Fed's move to move into QE3 is Peter Schiff, CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. Fresh off his testimony to Congress last week on why the president's last three jobs plans, or is it four, have failed. Now, the reason I like to have uh, Peter Schiff on with us is he got ridiculed, as you know, many of you know, all over international television and and major print publications for predicting the collapse of 2008, 
then for saying that all the stimulus and banker bailout wouldn't work. And uh, now more and more, they're finally listening to him, kind of like they're starting to listen to Congressman Ron Paul. Peter Schiff, of course, also has uh, been one of the monetary advisors on economics for Congressman Ron Paul, and he joins us now. Peter, thank you for being here with us. Yeah, you know, thanks for having me on, Alex. And I wish they were listening to me. I mean, maybe they're hearing me now, but I'm not sure they're actually listening to what I'm saying. They might be tuning it out. Uh, let's get into the testimony to Congress uh, last week uh, and uh, basically what they ask you and uh, how you responded. Well, I mean, the whole idea they wanted to have a hearing to try to figure out how to create jobs. And of course, that's what they like to do in Washington is convene hearings. But the reality is they don't need a hearing to figure out why there's no jobs. All it need is a mirror. You know, and so I was there to try to, you know, let let Congress know that they're the reason there's no jobs. If they want to wonder why, you know, why the jobs are disappearing, it's because of actions that government is taking that drives up the cost of employment, that punishes people for employing people, and that makes people look for all sorts of ways to avoid hiring, whether it's using automation or outsourcing or just simply you know just not growing a business and so the only thing that government can really do to create jobs is to stop destroying them and destroying the incentives for the private sector to create the jobs i see varying reports from spain portugal where they've tried the failed green jobs and now we know about the half billion stolen at least from one of the uh, by one of the obama uh, green energy job companies but I was seeing numbers of tens of millions of dollars that it costs for every $50,000 job. I mean, surely, Peter, they're not this stupid. There's got to be some method of the madness. Isn't this more of a mafia government and it's just about paying off their cronies? Don't overestimate their intelligence. I've gotten into trouble uh, overestimating people's intelligence before. But, I mean, either they're stupid or they're just trying to get elected and they don't care, But or a combination of the two. But, you know, a lot of what, what, what Congress has to understand is we don't want jobs because we want to work. We want jobs because we want all the things uh, that jobs produce. We want goods. We want to consume. We want to have a high standard of living. Jobs are a means. They're not an ends in and of themselves. And, you know, government can create work. They can make sure we all work really hard, but we have nothing to show for it. That's not what we want. We want productivity. And we're not going to get productive jobs from government. We're going to get that from profit-seeking entrepreneurs. But was... Congress receiving this information? I mean, did, did anything positive happen? I don't know. Look, I had, uh, I had some good conversations. You know, I got Dennis Kucinich, who I was surprised. I had a nice discussion with him uh, in private after the hearing. He's coming on my radio show on Friday on the, the Peter Schiff show. So, you know, and that's the Democratic side. So, I mean, he seemed that he was open to my ideas and he was willing to listen. Uh, but that's just one step. I mean, we, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot more than, uh, than, than, than one Democrat, uh, you know, expressing an open mind. I mean, we actually need decisive action quickly. Uh, because we're running out of time. Well, I want to bring up a positive point. I have seen some mainstream uh, articles with economists saying, look, we need to cut taxes, and then that will actually create more revenue. And something that big government engineers don't seem to understand is that what in every case of history, and I want you to complement this uh, information or, or expand on it, Peter, Kennedy cut the top tax rate by half. Uh, he cut the next tax rate by uh, close to half and tax receipts doubled. So the bureaucrats have to know that when they increase taxes like California's done or like Greece has done, that it takes an economy and puts it into a stall. So why are they doing this? Yeah, well, I mean, it's politics. I mean, really, if, if they want the best taxes to reduce, to generate growth and additional income is the marginal rate of taxes. But of course, that, that's what they're talking about increasing. But we have so much debt now, there's so much government spending that it can't just be cutting taxes. We have to cut government spending because if we replace tax revenue with deficits, that's going to do more damage to the economy. That's the point that I was trying to make in front of Congress. The deficits are actually doing more damage to the economy than the taxes. But yes, we need legitimate tax reform. We have to move away from punishing people for working hard, risking capital, uh, you know, and, and generating wealth. We need to move towards a consumption-based taxation system that doesn't damage economic growth. But 
at the same time, we have to stop all the government spending. That is the drag on the economy. It's the burden that government places on the economy that's depriving it of the resources that it needs to grow and create jobs. Okay, well, that's common sense. And uh, I agree with you that historically that's a no-brainer. But where you have really uh, been stunningly accurate is in your basic overall projections and predictions of what was going to happen in the economy. In the intro, I mentioned a lot of the things that you were dead on uh, about. And as a student of history, I can certainly see collapse, uh, further dollar devaluation, a lot of horrors in the future as well. But specifically, looking forward, on the course the world is now, QE3, uh, the euro debt bubble, they're talking about transferring the euro into this new financial oligarchy. How do you see all of this basically shaking out? Well, you know, it's not going to be pretty. Again, you know, it's like they're throwing gasoline on a fire and expecting the fire to go out. It's just going to get bigger. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have really severe structural problems underlying the economy. They've got to be fixed. The market wants to fix them, but the government won't let it uh, because the government doesn't like the pain uh, that we have to go through to fix these problems, just like a drug addict doesn't like rehab, and so maybe he doesn't want to uh, go through it. He'd rather just keep using drugs, but that's not in his long-term interest, and it's not in the long-term interest of our economy to keep shooting us up with monetary heroin so that we're oblivious to the pain and don't go through the restructuring process. So as long as we're continuing on this course, we're gonna keep going in the same direction, which means the economy will never recover, uh, good jobs will never be created. The standard of living of the average American will continue to decline. Uh, the cost of living will rise much faster uh, than his wages, if he even has any wages, because jobs are going to be disappearing. And eventually it will end in, in anarchy, I mean, in, in, in riots, in, 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 in civil uh, duress. Uh, who knows what the government is going to do under that environment, because we've lost so many of our rights. Uh, under uh, better circumstances, imagine what the government might do uh, when things got uh, to that point. But that's what's going to happen. I think we're going to have to have a real painful crisis before our leaders uh, do anything uh, right, before they take a chance on, on not getting reelected in order to do what's good for the country. Well, Peter, going back now more than 12 years ago, I... Um, went to different <clears throat> urban warfare events, different military drills. I put documentaries out showing the military training to lock down U.S. cities, training to confiscate firearms. Uh, people were so shocked by the footage I had in Police Day 2000 that they didn't even think it was real. Now we've seen Katrina, we've seen other events, any excuse for a federal power grab, that's the appetite, grow, grow, grow. Now we see uh, Mayor Bloomberg saying there's going to be riots if this continues. We see the degeneration in Europe. And, and I understand there's a lot of slugs and lazy people uh, who are sh thinking short term in government. But at the same time, there has been uh, a, a, a authoritarian buildup behind the scenes in the last 12 to 15 years uh, in this country. And if they weren't thinking about using martial law to uh, impose their corruption a decade ago, they're certainly now uh, starting to talk about it today. And you're starting to allude to some of that. So specifically, what do you think is coming in the future if the course is not changed? And do you think that the establishment is going to change course? No, I said they're not going to change course as long as the world will keep lending its money. So as long as the Chinese are buying our debt and the Japanese and Saudis, and as long as we can go into debt, uh, we're going to keep doing that. We're going to postpone the pain, but we're going to run into a problem very soon where we can't do that, where we have a dollar crisis, a sovereign debt crisis, uh, where bond rates really start to surge, the dollar starts to plunge, prices really start to rise, and that's when the problems really set in. Because then what is the government going to do? How are they going to respond to skyrocketing food and energy prices. Are they going to put price controls in place uh, like we did in the 1970s? That's when you get your shortages. That's when you get your riots. But even if we don't do that, if we embark on an austerity program, which would be the right thing, you know, the people who are used to getting government checks aren't going to take that line down. I mean, people are going to be frustrated. Well, that's my next question. And, and, I mean, look what's happening in, 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 in Italy or, or London or Greece. I mean, it's going to happen here, only I think worse. Listen, I'm all for getting people off of dependency because we know it doesn't work. It creates generations of uh, basically crime-addled, drug-addicted uh, zombies. 
And we've got close to 50 million Americans, as you know, on the form of digital um, soup kitchens, uh, bread lines, uh, on, the, uh, on the food stamps and little digital cards. But what about the corporate welfare? What about the trillions on defense? What about the trillions in banker bailouts? I mean, I've, I've seen the numbers, but correct me if I'm wrong. We could get rid of all the entitlements and the rest of it. And still, if we don't say no to these derivatives and make Wall Street, the firms that sold this crap, take a haircut, uh, we're still going to be in the same position. Well, we have to end all forms of welfare or warfare. You know, we, we're broke, but politically, it's hard to say that we're going to cut out uh, the welfare that uh, the middle class enjoys and, and, and continue to, to the largesse uh, that the Wall Street bankers enjoy. We've got to put an end to all forms of corporate welfare, government subsidies. We need to go back to free market forces. If you're going to succeed in this country, you succeed without help from the government. You succeed in the marketplace because you succeed in delivering a better product to your customers. You, you lower their costs, you increase the quality. You've got to earn your money. We've got to take away this rent-seeking, the ability of politicians to dole out special favors in exchange for support that helps them get reelected. And that's special favors to Wall Street and Main Street. We have to level the playing field. We have to go back to a free market economy where government is insignificant in size and in influence. We want small government where we can have low taxes and we can take care of ourselves. We don't need to live in a nanny state in this social welfare program because it's bankrupted other countries in the past and it's bankrupting us now. And you know, when you have somebody like Mayor Bloomberg, when you and I were talking about riots years ago, and that was, oh, these guys are crazy, this is you know, kookiness. Well, now you got mainstream guys like Bloomberg saying, we're going to have riots if things don't change. And I think Mayor Bloomberg is incorrectly looking for some government program to, to prevent the riots. It's these government programs that are ensuring the riots because the government programs can't work. And the when the government, government fails, will only make the situation worse. And when the government fails, it's a time bomb. Uh, this will be the last question because of your time and our constraints here on the nightly news. But Congressman Ron Paul, I mean, obviously you're a supporter. Uh, what do you think of uh, his run? Uh, I mean, is that not a silver lining that he's getting even more support than he got three and a half years ago, A, uh, and uh, B, what do you think of the different dirty tricks and media tactics they've used against him? And yeah, the media is completely, you know, trying their best to minimal, marginalize him. I mean, look, when, when Michelle Bachman won Ames, she was all over the news, even though she barely beat Ron Paul, who wasn't even mentioned. Then just recently, Ron Paul wins a straw poll in California, the biggest state in the union, and there's no mention of it on the Sunday shows at all. He won in a landslide, and then, as a matter of fact, Texas just called off their straw poll because it looked like Ron Paul was going to win. And I guess the Republicans didn't want uh, to see Rick Perry lose to Ron Paul in his home state. They thought that was too good a story for the media to ignore. So the way they got around it was they canceled the poll altogether. But look, he's running third. Ron Paul in the latest poll has as much support as Bachman, Gingrich, Santorum, and um, uh, uh, and uh, what, what's his name? Uh, I can't even remember the guy's Mayor name. Mayor Romney. Not Romney. Uh, uh, Huntsman. Huntsman, combined. All four of those candidates combined. In fact, it came out that Ron Paul has got more contributions from the military than all of his Republican components combined. He's getting more contributions than Barack Obama. If well, he's don't so the dirty the defense, tricks. Why do our troops want, want, want uh, Ron Paul to be their commander in chief? Look, this is a big story. He's the dark horse. But you know what? He's going to keep on gaining uh, gaining momentum. It really is a, a, probably a three person race. But Ron Paul, don't count him out. You know, the media wants to write him off. But despite everything that they're doing, he's gaining traction because he's the only guy that speaks the truth. He's, a, he, he's in there for his country. He's not just trying to, you know, enhance his resume. He's, he doesn't care about the power. He actually, you know, he's been fighting for these principles his whole life. You know, some people that talk about the Tea Party, he was a Tea Party congressman before the Tea Party even existed, before they even knew what, 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 what the principles that they're standing for. So he, this is his time, and I, I really hope that he wins. If anyone deserved to be president, it's Ron Paul, and he would make a fantastic president. And if he got elected, and we actually got some congressmen and some, some senators uh, that were elected alongside him, we might have a chance. You know, I might have to change my whole business strategy. I wouldn't have to be gloom and doom anymore.
You know, well, I, don't it, I mean, it is our top that's investing in America. I could bet on America instead of against it. But right now, betting against it is like a sure thing. Well, it is archetypal. I, I totally agree with you that that right as America's imploding, here's a guy for 30 plus years who's been absolutely on target and we've got a chance to elect him president. And he is in the top three candidates, depending on the poll, as you said, number one, number two or number three, with all the dirty tricks in the Wall Street Journal. When he gets over half, won't even show his name. MSNBC, he gets 60 percent, won't show his name. I mean, the, uh, Fox News got caught dubbing over him being booed when he won CPAC the second time from the year before. All sorts of weird, dirty tricks. That illustrates the establishment the left. The establishment is afraid of this guy because he's against everything that they stand for. He is the most anti-establishment candidate, and that's exactly what we need. That's what the public wants, but the, but, but the establishment knows they can't, they can't let the public know about him because they, they, they're afraid that they're so going to... So if we don't get Ron Paul, though, and things continue, are we looking at total collapse in a year, or is it just continued inflation? Well, ultimately, the inflation will bring on a collapse unless the Federal Reserve takes action uh, to put an end to it. But, of course, the longer we wait, the longer we keep rates low, the higher they're going to have to rise, the more painful the cure becomes. So, it, look, it is going to be disaster, e even if we do everything right. At this point, since we've delayed it for so long, it, you know, it's going to be a train wreck. But at least if we do everything right, uh, we can walk away from the train wreck. <clears throat> you know, but if we continue on this path... Everybody's going to die, you know. So let, let's do the right thing while we still That's have right. a chance. That's right. We've seen the big tax and spin globalist model that doesn't work. Uh, CEO of Euro Pacific Capital, Peter Schiff. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Sure. Thanks for having me on, Alex. Wow, <laughs> that interview went long. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I just can't keep the news to the format when you got people like Peter Schiff on. Just amazing information. We're going to go to break and come back and talk to Kurt Haskell. He was the guy that witnessed with his wife the U.S. government helping get the underwear bomber on the plane. And a month and a half later, the Undersecretary of State had to admit, yeah, we were ordered to help give him a passport and get him on the plane. Then that was used to put in the naked body scanners. Now the TSA is training the NFL to grope every man, woman, and child that comes into a sports stadium. We're going to talk to him about that and a lot more after this quick break. I'm Alex Jones with InfoWars Nightly News and InfoWars.com. Obama is notoriously a liar. We need to go to where the real architecture of government is, and it's not in a president. Wall Street has hijacked Washington in broad daylight. Well, Obama's already fudging. Yeah, He's fudged since day one in this election. The elite are using Obama to pacify the public so they can usher in the North American Union by stealth, launch a new Cold War, and continue the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. The globalists are outside all the nations. That gives them safety, and they play countries off against each other. You've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. What they're doing is using the existence of the United States to act out their Wall Street fantasies of world domination and maintaining their capital structures and maintaining their system of looting. The fight that this country has been waging since its inception is for the central bankers not to take over the country. President Barack Obama is only the tool of a larger agenda. Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others have a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. Presidential candidate Barack Obama was publicly criticizing the North American Free Trade Agreement in a bid for votes, but privately telling Canadian officials not to worry about it. If you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military force. What do you call this thing where you get this false sense of gratification, but because a black man is in office, everything's gonna be all right. No, everything's not gonna be all right. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now, especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. The Obama deception. 
the truth strikes back. Get your copy of The Obama Deception today at Infowars.com or download it in super high quality at PrisonPlanet.tv. It is a big idea, a new world order. In the near future, Earth is dominated by a powerful world government. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? For thousands of years, their dark order grew. Now, as they hail the birth of the New World Order, their great dream of exterminating 80% of humanity is at hand. For the first time in history, the elite's plan for world government is blown wide open. You will learn the secret that drives the entire New World Order agenda. Bilderberg is making great progress toward a world government. Only an educated, informed public can stop them in their tracks. Alex, it's Chalabi, eh? For the first time, all the pieces have been put together. The dots have been connected, and the picture is crystal clear. Earth's ruling elite believe they have discovered the fountain of you. But before they can attain it, 80% of us must die. A psychopathic technocracy is establishing world government so there can be no escape from their plan. The New World Order is the Old World Order. I mean, it's just the names have changed, the appearances have changed. Most people have no idea. They're not after money. They have all the money they need. They're after power. That's their aphrodisiac. Pull out the plane in Munich. They interrogated me four hours. Some shots were fired. Need you to move off the problem. Their great dream of exterminating 80% of humanity is at hand. Endgame. Blueprint for global enslavement. You have been warned. The establishment called him extreme and unelectable. They said he was the wrong man for the job. It's why a young Texan named Ron Paul was one of only four congressmen to endorse Ronald Reagan's campaign for president, believing in Reagan's message of smaller government and lower taxes. After Reagan, Senator Al Gore ran for president, pledging to raise taxes and increase spending pushing his liberal values. And Al Gore found a cheerleader in Texas named Rick Perry. Rick Perry helped lead Al Gore's campaign to undo the Reagan revolution, fighting to elect Al Gore president of the United States. Now, America must decide who to trust, Al Gore's Texas cheerleader or the one who stood with Reagan. Ron Paul, restore America now. Welcome back. It's InfoWars Nightly News. It is September 20th, 2011 on this Tuesday edition. And we're about to get to the conclusion of tonight's transmission with Kurt Haskell. He's one of the survivors of the attack on the plane from Amsterdam to Detroit, Michigan, a couple Christmases ago. And he witnessed some things that are incredible. You see, they're now announcing the jury selection for the underwear bomber, and the underwear bomber doesn't want his lawyers to represent him. And Mr. Haskell has been there at the trial. He himself is a lawyer, and, well, he has, again, some information that is bombshell, to say the least. He will be joining us today, and he's also going to tell us what the uh, lawyers uh, for the underwear bomber uh, are now thinking is really going on. This is breaking news coming up today. But first off, you've heard about Big Sis and the giant telescreens everywhere in the aftermath of the underwear bomber. Uh, the the 9,000 locations of malls and Walmart saying don't trust anybody but government. Um, of course, don't trust anybody but 
the police state. And now, of course, they've got TV ads on uh, saying, don't trust your neighbors and Al Qaeda is everywhere and rebranding and over to the Tea Party and anybody who's a libertarian. Well, now they're going to pay uh, coffee shops and transit facilities and others uh, to put the little uh, sleeve that goes on the coffee so you don't burn your hand, little cardboard uh, hand holder uh, to have a classically Orwellian uh, archetypal uh, all-seeing eye staring at you saying, if you see something, say something. So the message is, you're being watched, you're a terrorist, and at the same time, don't trust anybody else, everybody is a terrorist. And of course, this is the exact message you would expect to get from the very people that are indeed the terrorists. You see, 10 years after 9-11, things are only going to get worse. More groping, more checkpoints with TSA-trained goons grabbing your wife's breasts and your child's genitals at the NFL football game. Not less. The more liberty you give up, the more tyranny you will live under. The American people, over 85%, are sick and tired of the private Federal Reserve and want it abolished. I've seen polls of close to 90% against Rick Perry's attempt to force Gardasil shots. USA Today, 85% against the TSA. I tell you, I talk to people on the street, it's more like 98%. I've talked to reporters at local TV stations, and they've got to go down and do an interview, and they're told, find somebody who supports the TSA and what they're doing. They've got to interview 40-plus people to find one person that supports it. In fact, that's an idea for tomorrow. A man on the street in Austin will get into the TSA at the airports. But now they're expanding out, as we've already covered, to the NFL. Now, what was the latest stunt of the TSA and the naked body scanner manufacturers and those that make money from it, like Chertoff? It was promoting naked body scanners now a year and a half ago when the Christmas Day underwear bomber struck. Well, it was Kurt Haskell and, of course, his wife, both lawyers, who witnessed the sharp-dressed man getting him on the plane without the passport. And a month and a half later, the State Department came out and said, well, it is true uh, that an unnamed U.S. agency asked us to help him get a visa. This is bombshell information. This is much bigger than Fast and Furious. They just re released audio recordings of the ATF trying to cover up. They were shipping guns into Mexico to blame the Second Amendment. Another false flag attack on this country's rights. And this is the guy in the face of media scrutiny and the FBI visiting him and the media saying, oh, this, this Haskell guy, you know, he's off in left field. Well, it all turned out to be true. And then other witnesses stepped forward on the other issues. So with us is Kurt Haskell uh, to look at the aftermath of how this has been used to further uh, chop America up, basically, and turn it into a police state because, well, the trial of the underwear bomber, and Mr. Haskell's a lawyer, so he can speak to this with some expertise, has now just gotten ready to begin, and he joins us. Thank you so much, sir, for being on with us. Hey, Alex. Good to be back. Well, my friend, you know, I've always got a lot of points I want to make, but you've got the floor. You want to recap the historical thing you witnessed with the uh, underwear uh, firecracker bomber? that we all have to run in fear of, or do you want to get into the latest information you've uh, garnered? It, it, you know, it's up to you, Alex. Do you have, you have a preference where you want to start? Uh, let's uh, start wherever you'd like. Okay. Well, I guess we'll start with what, what I saw in Amsterdam, in case so someone's watching or listening that doesn't know who I am. Uh, you know, back in, on Christmas Day 2009, my wife Lori and I were traveling back from Africa, passing through uh, Amsterdam on our way to Detroit, sitting at the gate playing cards, and uh, I saw an Indian man around age 50 wearing a tan suit, walking with, uh, looked like an African teenager who had on uh, jeans and a white t-shirt, didn't have a coat, didn't have any bags. So remember, we're in the middle of winter, and Amsterdam's pretty cold. It's about as cold as it is uh, around here in Detroit in winter. And, uh, you know, I thought they were an odd pair. So I watched them as we were playing cards. They went up to the, the desk together, talked to the security airline worker who was working there. Just the, um, the Indian man spoke, and he said, this man needs to board the flight, but he doesn't have a passport. And then the, uh, the worker said, well, you have to have a passport to get on the flight. And the Indian man then said, well, he's from Sudan. 
we do this all the time. And then she uh, referred them down a hallway, which was still in a secure area, and said, you need to go talk to a manager down the hallway. And, uh, you know, at the time, it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know who these people were, absolutely nothing. But a few hours later, as we were coming to coming down to land in Detroit on our flight, the African man tried to detonate a bomb on our plane. And he's subsequently known as the underwear bomber. Um, and I was pretty stunned after we landed. I, and I noticed that it was the same guy. And I, I uh, leaned over Lori and I said, hey, I think maybe I've seen something important here. And right after we got off the plane, uh, the first chance I got, I told the story to the FBI, and I've repeated it hundreds of times since. And obviously, the media doesn't want to cover it. The government doesn't want to hear it. And, uh, you know, I've been stonewalled by everybody, pretty much, except you and a few other um, people in the media that want the story out there. But, you know, that's what has gotten me... Uh, known and that's why you want to talk to me i'm sure well the bombshell though is and it came out with the detroit free press and a few other places but got no national coverage that what the undersecretary of state said yeah we were asked quote by an unnamed u.s agency to get him a visa and then here he is without the passport and stuff being gotten on the plane i mean this is incredible uh, about an hour after it happened I, it was christmas day i was going to get eggs at the local corner store for my wife and an hour after it happened, they were already saying, don't worry, we're not going to put scanners in. And they were behaving as if they just decided to do this. But I had remembered that they'd purchased them and, well, started the order for them a year before. So it was a complete rollout. I mean, it had all the signs of a PR uh, event, and that's always a telltale when something staged. And then more and more began to come out, and then others described him as looking disheveled. Uh, I think you described him as kind of out of it. And, and so many times, it, it now turns out Amor al Fox News, AP, Reuters all report, number three in Al-Qaeda, the underwear bomber that uh, you had a, a, a visit with with a little pop in his pants or whatever you, uh, it, it was you and others saw and heard. Uh, you've got uh, the Times Square attacker. Uh, you've got the Fort Hood shooter. Uh, you've got so many others who he handles basically as 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 their connection. The CIA told Congress, we won't let you have his two years of emails to Major Hassan at Fort Hood. And then we learn he's secretly hanging out at the Pentagon while he's on the most wanted list, number three in Al-Qaeda. And now, just last week, the State Department won't release under national security their records of the supposed number three of Al-Qaeda. I mean, at a certain point, Kurt, this is getting a little too obvious. And I know you like, as a lawyer and as an American, to... You know, just stick to the facts, man, like the guys from Dragnet. But at a certain point, I mean, this is as staged as a $3 bill when the handler of this guy who supposedly almost killed you and your wife uh, is being handled by a guy hanging out secretly with the Secretary of the Army. What's your view on that? Well, you know, Alex, I've been on your show, I think, four or five times now. But the first two or three times I came on, I wasn't drawing these conclusions yet. I'm sure your listeners remember when I was on and, you know, I wanted to stick to the facts and have the case build up to where uh, I actually believed what you're saying, that this was an intentional government plot. And at some point there became enough evidence where I, uh, I firmly agree with you that this was definitely a stage plot by the U.S. government. And I think any of your listeners that are having doubts to that, I think the best evidence of that is to go on the internet and Google Patrick Kennedy underwear bomber testimony and watch the video of the Undersecretary of the State Department, Patrick Kennedy, as he squirms in his testimony at Congress, trying every which way to not admit that this was an intentional plot. I think it's very telling. Just watch how he acts. It's obvious he's trying to hide what we all know, those of us that are paying attention, and this was a stage plot by the U.S. government, and there's a lot of evidence that supports that. Um, not a stage plot with a bomb, but with a defective bomb. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that this bomb could not have even detonated because it lacked a blasting cap. And I've had discussions with Umar's, Umar, the, I'll call him Umar, the underwear bomber, his standby attorney, Anthony Chambers, who has indicated to me and even made a statement 
to the Detroit Free Press in December 2010 that the own experts the government has hired have indicated to him that the bomb could not have exploded, that it was impossibly defective. So how do you justify that with the uh, supposed story of what happened, that he flew you know, to Yemen, had this bomb sewn in his underwear, traveled back to Nigeria, to Amsterdam, to Detroit, or whatever We've seen this footage they've released where he's got the hood on, and it looks like bad 70s uh, or 1980 Empire Strikes Back with Obi-Wan Kenobi when he's the ghost. I mean, it's flickering, put into the black. I mean, we're video people, and it's pretty easy to see that that's fake. Like the Bin Laden videos, all of it, it's turned out those are fake. This is really getting insane. And, and let's just say it's real, though. Land of the free, home of the brave. We've got to give up all our rights and have our children groped, our wives groped, checkpoints, uh, TSA at proms, because a guy had a, a bomb go off. And I'm going from memory since I first interviewed you a year and a half ago, but uh, did you even hear anything go off? Yeah, yeah. Uh it was quiet though it was more like pop 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 pretty quiet and uh you know it was mostly screen a lot of screaming and what really got my attention was the fire obviously i was watching the fire because this wasn't just a you know a bomb that malfunctioned it could start a fire and that's what had me worried the fire was spreading really quick and then so we haven't I, even gotten into the part where you land and the guy that's videotaping this is taken off and they say there's bombs get out of here and then later forget it that never happened I mean, clearly, there is a textbook cover-up going on here, and it's funny the State Department's involved, because studying and, and reading books by former Navy SEALs like Richard Marcinko and others uh, from the uh, uh, rogue team that he was part of, and talking to a lot of people in black ops, and the British have admitted they do this, they will stage dud bombs or flashbang attacks on their own embassies or on their own diplomatic cars from time to time, if they, most governments do this, if they want to get the staff more serious about security, if they want to get more funding. And this this dud bomb event uh, run by the same guy, Alaki, where the person's trying to light his shoe on fire when, when everybody knows plastic explosive is not lit, it's an electrical charge. I mean, it's the same thing. And even mainstream media in the last year has had to cover all the fake patsies that they recruit out of prison who, who are terrorists, mentally ill, addled, normally, mildly retarded, who, who the FBI doesn't infiltrate, they lead them and offer them hundreds of thousands of dollars if they'll bomb the Christmas tree in Portland or if they'll attack this or that. So, so, so clearly, they're trying to manufacture these events. Kurt Haskell, uh, where do you see this country going? What's your overall view on the fact that there's big sis at the football games and uh, big telescreens going up saying, watch your neighbor and, and, and see something, say something with eyeballs on it, on coffee cups. I mean, it's like we've woken up in 1984. Yeah, you, you know, I could go on and on for hours about this, Alex. <laughs> I have so much to say about it. But, uh, you know, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, this country is going downhill. It, it's time to leave this country. It's only going to get worse. Voting's not going to make it better. Those of you that are holding out for Ron Paul to win the presidency, forget it. It's not going to make a difference, even if he wins. Uh, this country is not going to change. It's gone too far unless, and I'm not calling for this, but I'm saying the only thing that would stop it would be an overthrow of the government, in my opinion. This country is too far gone, keeps getting worse and worse all the time. There's no stopping it. The media is complicit. The, everyone in the government is complicit. It's a complete disaster. Um, you know, and speaking of the NFL, interestingly enough, I didn't know TSA was getting involved in the NFL, and I actually had tickets and went to the game Sunday, uh, Kansas City Chiefs versus Detroit Lions, and I got there 17 minutes before kickoff, and I didn't get in before kickoff because of all the pat-downs that were going on. Oh. I was kind of excited. Uh, I missed about the first five minutes of the game. But um, a, a point I wanted to make a minute ago, which I haven't talked to you about yet because I haven't been on your show since earlier this year, but there was a hearing I went to in the underwear bomber case on July 7th, and some some pretty interesting things happened. Can I? Do we have a minute where I can get into this? Absolutely. I've been bringing up a lot of history and past stuff. You've got the last five minutes. You've got the floor. You're going to the okay. hearings, and that's why you're, you're, you're here. Yeah. So dispensing with the background, you've been going to the hearings. You're talking to the underwear uh, bombers, uh, lawyers. Uh, so you're giving us breaking inside info that the national media is not covering. So, Kurt, you've got the floor. Tell us all about it. 
Yeah, I, I figured that out. I started going to hearings, and then I would read the, the press reports about the hearings, and they would be totally different than what I would see at the actual hearing. And one of them was uh, on July 7th. It was a hearing. The, this hearing was scheduled because the standard attorney, Umar standby attorney, asked to delay the trial. And he asked to delay the trial because he said he was um, just before, and this would have been in June, so we're talking 18, 19 months after the bombing. He was just given uh, a, a great deal of uh, what he called the most significant evidence of the case. And he asked for some additional time to go through and hire experts and to delay the trial, which is set for uh, a few days from now, starting October 4th. But he then went on to describe the evidence he was just given. And I think it's pretty interesting. If you think about what my theory on the case is, that an undercover agent uh, from the U.S. government gave Umar an intentionally defective bomb and escorted him through security. That's what really happened here. So keep that in mind with what the evidence was that he was given at the last minute. A copy of Umar's passport. He was given a disk containing a chemical analysis of the bomb. Airport security video and audio. Uh, four discs of DNA analysis. I'm not really sure of what, but that's what he said. And then the last one was a witness statement from a, I'll go over this slow because it's kind of confusing, a Dutch non-law enforcement citizen, government profiler, who talked to Umar during the time in question. So what I make out of this, Dutch, okay, non-law enforcement, okay, government profiler, kind of weird, who could this be? Psychologist during the time in question. I think this is the sharp dressed man. And I think the sharp dressed man was the per a person at the airport that in um, Amsterdam, they have a, an additional level of security. That being a security interview of some sort after you go through, you know, metal detectors. That's Israeli so style, I, isn't it? Yeah. So I'll repeat that again. Dutch. Okay. Um, Non-law enforcement, okay, he's not law enforcement, he's a profiler. Government profiler, okay, who talked to Umar during the time in question. Okay, so Chambers is being dumped at the last minute, this statement from this guy, along with a passport, uh, airport security video and audio, and a chemical analysis of the bomb. Now, why was all this evidence withheld for 18 or 19 months? To give him the least amount of time to go through it and hire experts to uh, to testify at trial over this evidence. Wait, I've got to wow. go back, though. This is so bombshell, because right. this is what you said originally. Only right. some type of high-level security person could get someone on a plane. And, and, uh, and, and going back, the, the gate person was arguing at first, and he basically dropped the hammer, and I'm the boss, and boom, he gets on. Only senior security could do that, and and uh, I've looked it up, you've looked it up, you're right, they have that additional humet or uh, uh, level where a profiler can interview you, and only security could bypass and intimidate a gate person into, into not doing their job. You have it right there. And we know the State Department, months after you first documented it, admits that they were basically ordered to help uh, get him through. So we have them. My God, Kurt, this is incredible, and thank God you were there. And none of it was reported in the media, but it, it was even worse than that, because Chambers was clearly irritated over this. He has to delay the trial, right? And there was a whole hearing over this. But then he said, you know, how can I even be sure I have all the evidence now, Judge? You know, I'm going to ask that if there's any other evidence that it be turned over to me immediately so I can at least look at that before the trial. And what, you know, what I would expect the government to say is, oh, you know, we gave you everything already. That's not what they said. What they said was, we have some other evidence that's secret. I think they said secret. I don't think they said top secret, but they said, we have some other secret evidence and we're not giving it to you until Judge Edmonds looks at it and decides if you should have it. And Judge Edmonds then said, well, I'll look at it and I'll decide if you can have it within the next two weeks. Wow, so the so, headline should have been in the New York Times. It should have been the New York Times. Secret evidence being withheld in underwear bomber trial. Uh, bomb, but no, 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 it's just there's no news about this. Right, and you know, why, let's say, okay, you believe the official story. He's some kind of crazy lunatic Al-Qaeda guy, whatever. Why is there secret government evidence being hidden from the defense in this case? 
Why? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Well, it's, it's clear, it's, Kurt. It's, I'm going to have to have you on the radio slash Skype as well on the uh, daytime show 11 to 2 in the next few days. This is so incredible. And, and, and hopefully we can interview you as the trial progresses. But other bombshells sure. from your court watching, what have his lawyers told them? Have you tried to say, hey, look for this angle. This is the M.O. of how they set people up. Yeah, you know, I, I've met with his, he doesn't have a lawyer, remember, he fired his lawyers. All he has is a standby lawyer, which is, uh, in layman terms, it's a helper, okay? But Umar still gets to make all the decisions. So I've talked to his standby attorney, I don't know, five, six different times, and I actually met with him for a few hours in his office one day, and I, I said, you know, I, I want to make sure you know what really happened here, and and you know, uh, this is my blog and make sure you read all my posts and evidence I had. And he said, um, yeah, we've been reading your blog and we've been getting our defense theories on the case from your blog. So I, to me, that was kind of flattering. No, but, you uh, were there. You're an eyewitness. Right. Uh, and he said, basically, you know, we didn't even know some of these things. We're not getting these details from Umar. And, uh, you know, it gives us a whole new angle on the case. We didn't even think of this uh, entrapment defense at all until we read your blog. But that being said, he told me that, again, standby attorney, this was six months ago or so. You know, we totally expect that we'll be, that him and his firm would be the full attorneys on the case and not stand by it by the time trials happen. Now, that hasn't happened. He's still representing himself, which to me, tells me one thing he's in on this too now how he became umar i'm talking about how he became in on this cover-up i don't know but well it's like mcveigh i've talked to lawyers involved experts police they basically told him you do this your whole family's dead that's one of the oldest tricks in the book they can also get a mentally ill person tell them they're a secret agent and then threaten them i think you'll find this is basically a playbook that they follow, and when you see the telltale signs and then confirm them, there it is again. What what does the defense think or the standby lawyer? What do what did what does your gut tell you as a survivor of this, Kurt? What does your wife think? As far as the defense? No, I mean what do you th what do you think's going on with Mutalib? Okay. I think he's in on it. Now I'm not sure whether this happened recently or he's been in on it all along and he could be in on it by being promised his release you know maybe they'll send him to guantanamo bay and release him i don't know or it could be a threat or it could be torture i don't know you know i asked his standby attorney that question and he didn't really know either all he said was you know i i haven't seen any evidence or heard anything that he's being tortured but america does it torture oh i forgot we do it's the new virtue <laughs> yeah but you know if if uh, Anthony Chambers was running this case, which he's not, he told me the defense would be entrapment and I would be one of the main witnesses at the trial. Obviously, that hasn't happened. It's well, standby happen. lawyer says the defense would be entrapment. So that's that's being looked at. My God, this is incredible. But he's he doesn't have a say so. Remember, he's only standby right now. So Umar is calling the shots. So, and I obviously I believe that's intentional. And what I, I'm seeing now is the last hearing, which I think was uh, 9 15, September 15. I, I couldn't make it to that one. I had some hearings of my own I couldn't get out of. But uh, there are reports in the media that Umar was acting crazy, refusing to button up his shirt, refusing to stand when the judge came out and he came into the courtroom yelling, Osama is alive. Okay, to me that tells me one thing. Uh, every time I've seen Umar, he's been very calm, reserved, very soft-spoken, not acting crazy at all. So to me, he's been told to act crazy, act crazy throughout the trial. Yeah, that was in the news. That was in the yeah. news that he did all that. Right, exactly. That's totally opposite. Which is another telltale sign. All this other bombshell stuff, the whore media, the complicit globalist media, the crime syndicate media, they don't cover it, but now they cover the outburst because it fits into the new legend. Well, I think he's being told to do this because otherwise people paying attention now for the trial would say, well, who's this guy? He doesn't seem very scary. He's just this small, reserved little guy. You know, I think they're telling him that crazy so it can be 
put it in the headlines, you know, he did this, this day or that. And that's why he's representing himself too. So the real story won't get out. But. Well, Kurt, this is too incredible. And the nightly news is going way over. Definitely. I need to get you on the radio in the next few days. Uh, uh, quickly, quickly, just give us a preview. What else have you learned? Um, you know, though I hit the main points already. I think, um, I'm going to know a lot more soon. The, um, Jury selection happens October 4th, and we have opening statements uh, starting October 11th. So I think you're going to start hearing a lot more, and I'm going to be able to tell you a lot more. Though, you know, those were the main things that I've hit recently, but of course, there's so much to the story I can't really. Oh, it's going to take a long time for me to even be able to digest this. I'm going to have to rewatch this interview several times. Uh, as we end the uh, broadcast here, Kurt, please stay there. I want to get you set up right now for the radio show, obviously, as soon as you can. You're a very busy man. Uh, you have a lot of courage, and we just appreciate your time. Uh, I understand why. Well, well, in closing, correct me if I'm wrong. You sound now not so much shaken, but uh, you're realizing that, that the rabbit hole goes very deep. I mean, for you to say, look, this country's done, it's cooked, stick a fork in it. The problem is this country's been seized by this global corporate crime syndicate and it's being used to take over the whole world, so there's nowhere to run. And believe me, I've thought about this a lot. I'm getting chills right now. We've got to fight these people. But, but it, certainly 18 months ago, you were not committed. You just said, I saw this. It's suspicious. It should be investigated. Now what you said has been confirmed by the State Department. You've watched the cover-up. You've watched all this other evidence, and now you're really facing it. I think as other Americans have the experience you've had, in that is our hope. And as people in government and media, it's time for them to decide what side they're on. Which This is not like we're just working with Boss Hogg here and, ha-ha, it's some corruption, good old boy stuff. This is really nasty, targeting our basic liberties and freedoms. The question is why? Because the foreign banks have imploded the country, and they know when we find out that we have been robbed, if we say, no, we don't owe these derivatives, they're going to all go to jail. But if they can put a dictatorship in of this oligarchy, of this police state, we're going to be their slaves. So this is all the marbles. This is everything on the table, Kurt. And, uh, I mean, I know I'm ranting here at the end, but this is one of the most powerful interviews I've ever done. Uh, in 60 seconds, your comments on what I just said. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you, Alex. You know, I, witnessing the story from the inside out, I've seen how it's played out over the past year and a half. And, you know, I was just a regular guy when this happened. I was, was nobody. I didn't really have these extreme thoughts of the government or anything. And, you know, but these are thoughts I've developed over the past 20 months, doing my research, talking to people, talking to uh, Umar standby attorney going to court hearings, talking and talking to other passengers. Yeah, his standby lawyers think the same thing. He does. Now he he's kind of hesitant to go out and say that, but you may yeah. see that come out during the trial. I don't know exactly how much input he'll have, but if he has his way, this is going to be the case. I'm skeptical that will happen, but yeah, I've developed these thoughts over the past 20 months. They're entirely justified. They're backed by my eyewitness count, other evidence I've come into. And, you know, if you don't like what I have to say, I, I'm sorry. But if you would do all the research that I've done, I think you would come to the same conclusion. Uh, and I, I think the USA is finished. Well, I yeah. hope you're wrong because we don't have anywhere to run. Believe me, if there was some place to go free of these people, I'd go there. Uh, this is the only ship we've got, and it's on fire, but all the other ships are on fire. Kurt Haskell, we appreciate your courage and glad you're here reporting for us. Uh, you're a victim. You're somebody who could have been killed by this, but you've, you've, you've certainly uh, had a lot of courage, and I know your wife has uh, as well. I'm sorry, yeah. your Skype's gotten a little bit delayed. Say it again. Sorry, Alex. I said I could have been killed by the fire, but not by the bomb. The bomb couldn't have detonated, but you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Kurt Haskell, thank you so much. We'll talk to you very soon. No problem. Oh, man. It's over, ladies and gentlemen. We've got uh, Dr. Andrew Wakefield in here, who the mainstream media claims has been discredited on the vaccine issue and autism. The opposite. It's turned out that they made it up and lied and said that uh, his, his evidence was a fraud, but now it's turned out it was all true, and a bunch of other private scientists and groups have confirmed his research to a T. It turns out before he did his research, it had been done, and now since after, 
And uh, now it's been confirmed that the Gardasil vaccine separately, the government admits 18,000 plus uh, adverse uh, reactions uh, and, of course, some deaths. And meanwhile, they've got Gardasil spokespeople out there saying no one's been hurt. It's perfectly good for you. Dr. Andrew Wakefield tomorrow in studio with us. We'll take you out uh, to the end with a short clip from him uh, on the radio show in studio Friday, breaking down what's happening with Gardasil in California. I'm Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars Nightly News. And what we're going through in California, you probably know it, this, this bill AB 499 at the moment, is taking away the rights of parents to determine whether their children get vaccinated. So girls as young as 12 can go to school and secretly get the vaccine of their own volition, hepatitis B, HPV, and the rights are taken away from the parents to look after their children. This is an utter disgrace.